Good morning, everyone. Um, this is the Ways and Means Budget uh, Subcommittee uh, meeting today. I'm John Quincy, Chair of that committee, and we're joined by Councilmember Palmasano and Bender. Um, no quorum is required, so we'll be able to begin and uh, take the presentations. Uh, other council members are, will be uh, joining us uh, presently as they're otherwise running around the city doing important work. So we'll... Um, We'll begin. I think the first one is with the Civil Rights Department. We'll be followed that with the Youth Coordinating Board. And later this afternoon, we'll be hearing from the uh, Minneapolis Park Board and the Mini uh, Municipal Building Commission, and then an overview, uh, kind of a wrap up of this committee's work. So, if we could begin this morning's session with uh, Civil Rights Department and its uh, department uh, leader, Velma Carbon, welcome. Good morning, um, Councilmember Quincy and committee members. It's a pleasure for me to present the 2016 mayor recommended budget for the Minneapolis Civil Rights Department. My name is Velma Corbel, and I'm the department director in the Minneapolis Department of Civil Rights. Uh, the first slide is the department's organization chart. There are 23 full-time staff in the department. The work is also supported by two boards. Uh, the Police Conduct Oversight Commission and the Minneapolis Commission on Civil Rights. Those boards, of course, are, are, are appointed by the mayor and city council. There's also a panel of civilians and, um, and sworn officers that make up the police conduct review panel. The civilians are appointed by the mayor and city council, and then both sworn and civilians are assigned uh, to case review by the department heads and both the uh, Minneapolis Police Department and the Civil Rights Department are their designees. The budget summary slide uh, is very basic. There's not a whole lot of change to this slide from the adopted budget of 2015. You will see a summary complaint investigations, contract compliance, Office of Police Conduct Review, and the Civil Rights Equity Division is largely unchanged. A couple of decreases in uh, the non-general fund revenue and in the in complaint investigations and also in the Contract Compliance Division that we'll go to in a little uh, deeper uh, detail as we go through the slides. The core programs in the Civil Rights Department will start with the Complaint Investigations Division. The work in that division really is the traditional civil rights work where the division handles complaints of discrimination filed by individuals who may work or live in the city of Minneapolis. The division also oversees an alternative dispute resolution program that's been very successful. The division also does quite a bit of outreach and engagement with the community so that the uh, individuals that we are uh, attempting to serve know who we are and where we are and how to get to us and what services we do provide. And the Civil Rights Commission, as a component of this division, also handles uh, appeals and pre presides over administrative hearings. The detail of the budget for the Complaint Investigations Division is on the next slide. A total budget of about $590,000 you will see the specific numbers there, the general fund, about 544,000. The non-general fund revenue is, the, is a, a work share agreement or a contract that the division has with the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And what happens is that in order to reduce redundancy and duplicative work between enforcement agencies, the EEOC actually pays the Civil Rights Department about $700 per case if we're investigating cases that are Title VII, the age discrimination cases, or Americans with Disabilities Act cases. So about 5.52 full-time equivalents to do the work of this division. You will also note on the second slide some performance data. One of the things that I always like to point out, uh, and I, I try never to miss an opportunity to mention, how efficient the division is in doing its work. One of the things that is a factor in how well it's performing is the, the number of months it takes to investigate a complaint. And we are well under that one year time frame. And what I like to point out is that most enforcement agencies across the country and in the region 
use a backlog number of somewhere between 300 days and 365 days. And the Complaint Investigations Division in, in Minneapolis uses as this markup backlog a number of 270 days. And people who have been around for a, a long time know that the department was historically plagued with a significant backlog. And one of the things that we did when we came to the department about five years ago was to correct that backlog and put some things in place where that would, um, that would not happen again. The work in this division is also supported by a relatively new program that the department has started called the Civil Rights Ambassadors, where we are making uh, relationships and creating an opportunity to engage with other nonprofits in the city to help uh, really promulgate the word and work of the department in communities that have historically been uh, really on the margins. And so we are working with um, the Hmong community, the uh, Minneapolis Urban League, the transgender community are some of the early, um, the early connections that we're making. So the outreach is significant in those uh, communities. This division also has a pretty significant relationship with law schools in town because a lot of our, our interns and our employees ultimately come from the schools here in the, in the Twin Cities. So there are substantial relationships that are being created and sustained there. The next business line or the next program area is contract compliance. And this uh, department handles a variety of work. They um, oversee the city's small and underutilized business program. They monitor inclusion participation goals for women and minority business inclusion and also workforce inclusion. They monitor contractor good faith efforts, review affirmative action plans, they oversee the city section three program for low income residents and businesses. And beginning about two years ago, almost three years ago, this division also began to certify small businesses for participation in its small and underutilized business program. One of the things that's not mentioned on this slide is that this division also does a significant amount of work in resolving wage violations that uh, occur on public contracts. And they do that in a, a couple of different ways. One is through a system that flags the compliance officer when a wage violation has occurred. And that's usually flagged when a, a certified payroll is entered into a, techn a technology system that alerts the compliance officer that a wage violation has occurred. And they can go in and resolve that with the contractor that they're working with. They also uh, will take in complaints from employees of contractors or from businesses of contractors and handle the, the wage violations that way. So they do a, a significant piece of work in that area that's not included <coughs> on the slide and I wanted to make sure to mention that. The budget for the contract compliance division for uh, 2016 is on this next slide. There's a, this is a fairly large number, the million five hundred thousand dollars, because our internal service charges are also included in that number. It's just the way the finance department has handled it in the past. So it shows up like that again in the 2016 budget. Um, so I will uh, move to the next. So a 9.74 FTEs are doing the work in this division. Ms. Uh, Corbel, I, I was yes. noticing, of course, there's a, also a drop in the non-general fund for that. Is that also from outside the, parties paying? The non-general fund reduction there is a result of a decrease to the community development block grant resources. I see. And as HUD uh, decreases the amount of money is paying for direct services, that number is decreasing uh, across, uh, across the city enterprise. And that's the, the reason for that decrease. There's a, one enhancement in the contract compliance budget this year, and that is for uh, a request of a one time for $150,000. And that is for um, disparity study. You, you may recall last year, the department made an initial uh, request for $300,000. And during the budget deliberations, it was asked if we would if the department would spend the entire 301 year and the answer was no, it was going to take a little bit of time to expend the full 300,000. And would it be practical then to uh, include the remainder? So 150,000 was budgeted in 2015. 
and uh, I was asked if it would be practical to include the remainder in 2016, and, and it was. And so this is the request for that additional $150,000 to finish up the disparity study. I would note here that we are in the process of a collaboration with the uh, Minnesota Department of Administration, uh, metropolitan agencies like the Metropolitan Council and other municipalities like the City of St. Paul to collaborate on a disparity study. The request for a proposal for a consultant was actually um, on the street about three weeks ago, and the plan is to have a study consultant select selected and to begin the actual disparity study for a variety of agencies in 2016. So, uh, the, so the city is one of the participants in that collaboration. The next few slides on contract compliance show some performance data. And I would point out that this data that you're seeing on this slide is, is fairly old. And um, the council members know that the, the department does a quarterly contract compliance report to the Public Safety, Civil Rights, and Emergency Management Committee. That report is coming up, I believe, in about two weeks. But I would um, just maybe scoop the report a little bit and just give you some updates on where we are with some of these numbers. So if you're looking at slide 11, contract compliance for minority and women business inclusion, the summary <laughs> by quarter, if you will look at the third quarter down there, it says third quarter 2014, 2.87, 4.69. Based on where we were last year to this time this uh, in 2015, there has been a pretty significant increase in our opinion in the Civil Rights Department. If you consider that this equates to dollars spent, that number is actually now for minority business enterprises, 6.81, almost 7% and for women business enterprises, almost 5.5% or 5.42. So that does, that's you know, bread on table or dollars in the pockets <clears throat> of these small businesses. So we're, uh, we're pleased about that. Ms. Corporal, is, yeah. is that number gonna be just the third quarter number or is it a Q1, two and three combined for a total? That's just the third quarter. So we're trying, so what I'm trying to give you is where we were in 2014, the number I just gave you with the increase that we'll be, um, we'll talk about in detail at the third quarter report. That is the third quarter number. Okay, thank you. So same thing if you go through um, to slide, uh, slide 12, that information is also fairly, fairly old. We'll update that again in the quarterly report, but this, we put this report together, I think, in June, May or June sometime of, of 2015. So the numbers have changed. Um, same thing in uh, on slide 13. And so we'll uh, update all of these numbers in, um, in the third quarter contract compliance quarterly report. Although I will point out on slide 13, third quarter 2014 for workforce inclusion, my staff has informed me that that minority number that you're seeing there at about 16.09 in the third quarter 2014, for the third quarter of 2015, that number is about 23%. So uh, again, scooping the contract compliance report, maybe stealing some thunder uh, from that team, I just wanna let you know that, that there has been improvement quarter by quarter in the results of this work. Thank you for scooping. <laughs> it's important to share, thank you. And slide 14, uh, same thing, will give you um, much better numbers on uh, workforce for closed projects in the third quarter quarterly report when um, Ms. Francois and her team bring that report to the Public Safety, Civil Rights and Emergency Management Committee in about two weeks. The next business line, slide 15, is the Office of Police Conduct Review. That is uh, the office that works uh, in conjunction with the Minneapolis Police Department to oversee um, police misconduct investigations in the city. And uh, the Office of Police Conduct Review is, on the review panel side, is really a joint effort between sworn and civilian staff. There's uh, 
staff of about 5.2 individuals in the Civil Rights Department that do the work, and then their partner department in the Police Department is Internal Affairs. And there are about seven investigators in the Internal Affairs Department. My understanding from talking with my staff is between three and five of those individuals are handling complaints that are filed by civilians, similar to the work that is happening in the civilian side, where there are two investigators. Now, my staff also has informed me that there are about 400 complaints that get handled by the Office of Police Conduct Review every year. That number is pretty static year by year, but the, the detail is actually when you go inside the number and think about, you know, you've got a seven investigator department in internal affairs and two investigators in the, um, the civil rights department. But about 75 to 80 percent of the intake work for the police conduct complaints happens in the civilian side. So the online intake, the walk-in intakes, that work is handled by the civilian side of the Office of Police Conduct Review, which is located in the Civil Rights Department. The other thing that when you go inside these numbers and, and try to understand it, is that even though there are half the number of investigators in the Office of Police Conduct Review, about half of the work of investigating the, the complaint happens in the Office of Police Conduct Review. We didn't request an enhancement in this budget this year, but uh, I want to go on the record in 2015 that when we come back doing to do the 2017 budget, I will be requesting staff to handle that workload. When we first created uh, by ordinance the Office of Police Conduct Review, we did talk about the fact that um, complainants should be given a preference on where they would come to file their complaint. Overwhelmingly, uh, complainants do use the civilian side of the Office of Police Conduct Review to do that. And uh, I think it's just only fair to note that so that the uh, additional resources that would be required to handle that work would follow the increase in the work that's happening in that division. So the budget detail on the Office of Police Conduct Review is on the next slide. No enhancements, about $600,000, 5.52 staff. Some performance data, again, this, uh, this information is was uh, as of 2014, the Office of Police Conduct Review updates its numbers uh, and provide quite a bit of detail every quarter. I think that the next quarterly report should be coming up soon at the Office of Police Conduct Review, published on the website. So there, there are updates to these slides as well. The final uh, business line in the Civil Rights Department is the Civil Rights Equity Division, and most people are familiar with this division because it oversees the Urban Scholars Program. The uh, Urban Scholars Program has been very successful, a leadership development program that provides meaningful work opportunities for uh, young people, mostly young people of color. If you re recall, when we created this program about four years ago, it was on the heels of some news about the employment disparity in Minneapolis between whites and African Americans and then whites and people of color as we looked more at the data. And the city uh, decided to step out and create a program that would address uh, this employment gap. And so it created the Urban Scholars Program, which has been very successful. Uh, there are several of the urban scholars that have graduated from their college programs, are the two, four, or graduate programs are now employees in the city of Minneapolis, <laughs> which is exactly what we intended the program to do. There are several urban scholars that are working for our partners where they've had meaningful work experience. I am happy to say that in the Civil Rights Department, our workforce gets younger and younger because I think we've hired eight urban scholars over the last several years, and um, they have done nothing but just bring value to the work that they're doing in that department. So 
um, I would encourage us to continue all the good work that we're doing in that regard. But the budget for the equity division is a small one, uh, so small but mighty. So they have leveraged their relationships, I think, to a great extent. About a $600,000 budget, 2.22 full-time equivalents, and there is an enhancement requested in this budget for 2016, about $92,000, so that we can increase uh, the number of urban scholars that we're bringing into the city of Minneapolis, but also so that we can administer the program well. There's some program elements, leadership development, speech craft, uh, things like that, that when you bring in extra urban scholars, you also have to pay for the, uh, the resulting fees. So this is what this will help us do, recruit, administer program, pay salaries, uh, pay for space. So that's what this $92,000 is intended to do. Ms. Corbel, if you yes. could, uh, we have a question from Councilman Palmasan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Corbel, um, so the $92,000 specifically, will it go to extra staffing help? It sounds like you're not hiring another person for this program, or will it go to its own separate office, or is this really all made up in like fees to market the program in different places and that sort of thing? Through, through the chair to Councilmember Palmasano, we, we don't really market the Urban Scholars Program anymore. We go out and uh, beat the streets and create partners that would bring an urban scholar into its workforce. Minneapolis Public Schools, Metropolitan Council, Park Board, et cetera. But what this, the resources are for salaries for urban scholars. It is also for program fees to pay for our speech craft program, to pay for our leadership development program but it's also supporting seasonal staff to come in to help do some of the recruiting for urban scholars during the recruitment period, which is uh, between now, November 1st, and the end of February. So seasonal work is fees, uh, programming fees, is salaries for urban scholars. Good, thank you. There's some performance data as well in the, um, that the equity division has provided that just shows some of the employment disparity data in the region, um, both slides 23, 24 shows uh, the city of Minneapolis workforce on page 25. And we know that by hiring these young people who come to us through the Urban Scholar Program, it is having a positive effect on diversity and inclusion in the city's workforce. And then slide 26 again is really, uh, we had projected a faster growth of the Urban Scholars Program uh, about four <coughs> years ago, but then this is all dependent on the resources that you have to run the program. And um, so we'll be at a little fewer than 200 in 2017, I would expect, but that, was, that has been the goal. And that's my final slide, Mr. Thank Chair. You. Thank you very much for the presentation and the uh, deeper dive into the enhancements portion of the budget. Are there any questions for council members? I see council member Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this goes a bit beyond um, the, the department's requests, but as we are working on uh, wage theft policy, uh, still, you know, we need to do that work as policymakers. I did have the opportunity to talk with you a bit along with some of my colleagues about how um, your division is already working with wage theft as an issue. Could you talk about that very briefly, again, because we do have the policy work to do, but just to take this opportunity to um, just share how you are already sort of interacting with this issue in our community, as well as how your division may help with enforcement of wage theft in the future. Mr. Chair, uh, Council Member Bender, so there are several ways that the Civil Rights Department touches the issue of wage theft. I just talked about the wage violations that the Contract Compliance Division is handling either through the system that flags uh, a wage violation or through complaints that employees of our contractors might file because they are not being paid proper wages or proper fringe benefits. But the other way that this happens is through the complaint investigations work that happens in the complaint investigations division. 
there are often, um, especially uh, lower paid workers in restaurants, in uh, home health care, in places where they're hourly, probably um, not as educated, not as sophisticated in understanding what their hourly wage and hourly rate should be. We do find that when we get complaints from uh, these individuals uh, for uh, employment discrimination, that oftentimes there is a related salary or wage issue. And what we find is that we can uh, we can make a finding on the workplace discrimination, but the wage theft piece that happens is is very diff is is difficult because there isn't an ordinance or a policy that goes directly to what happens when an employee is not being paid what they should be being paid on the job. Uh, one of the stories that one of my investigators has told me is that there have been complaints of individuals, mostly Spanish speaking individuals who work behind uh, in the back of the house in restaurants will oftentimes not even know what their hourly rate should be because they can't calculate out over the number of hours they've actually been on the job to know whether or not they've been underpaid. And so it would be, um, it would be nice to have a law in place in the city that would give us um, the wherewithal to be able to go in and specifically look at the wages and the distribution of wages that these individuals are being paid. Good. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Councilmember Palmasano, followed by Councilmember Gordon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, this is a separate topic. Could we go back to the Urban Scholars just briefly in something that's not apparent from your presentation is how many Urban Scholars do we have roughly on a yearly basis? Uh, through the Chair, Councilmember Palmasano, could you repeat the end of that question? How many Urban Scholars do we have each year? Each year. Just approximately. Um, I, I happen to have that number. Thank you, uh, Ms. Gardner, for providing that to me. Uh, so in 2015 in the city of Minneapolis, there were 29 urban scholars that were working, uh, each paid from the city budget. What we have uh, typically said to departments is that if the budget pays for your, the budget that is uh, appropriated through this process pays for your first urban scholar, if you want more than one, if you want two, if you want three, then we ask that departments would fund that urban scholar. So 29 urban scholars in the city of Minneapolis. And then our partners also hired urban scholars, 11 at the Met Council, Park Board One, uh, construction, PCL Construction One at the state of Minnesota, six, public schools eight and Twin Cities United Way two. So what happens with that is that we are paying you know, wages and full administration for the urban scholars that work here in the city of Minneapolis. But through a memorandum of understanding, we are attempting to recoup the fees for the urban, the administrative fees for the urban scholars that work in other places. So uh, the Metropolitan Council, for example, pays a portion of administrative fees to the city, they pay for the speech craft or the Toastmaster program that the urban scholars do. They pay for um, the um, leadership development program that the urban scout, their urban scholars participate in. So we are trying through a memorandum of agreement to recoup the administrative and program fees from the partners so that the city is only paying for the urban scholars that are inside the city of Minneapolis. Thank you. And then um, a follow-up question to Councilmember Bender's point. Um, you mentioned wanting to have a, a law um, at the city level to go and investigate um, and, and do more work to make sure that people are being paid uh, what they are said to be paid and what they deserve. Could you speculate um, on what kind of additional resources that will mean from your department to actually go and do something like that? Through the chair and council member Palmasano, I, I don't have anything but an estimate because it really would depend on the number of complaints that would be coming in to the department. But as I've talked to my staff, because this is, this is a new area of work, it's a new law that would be created in the city 
there's a new level of expertise that would be needed to understand it, to implement it, to enforce it. So we would need at least two people, I think, a couple of them to do the initial education and outreach to, to people in the community, both businesses and employers, because it um, isn't feasible to me that you could begin to implement a new law without at least doing some initial outreach to those areas that seem to be the most likely violators. So there would need to be that. And then we would need staff inside the department to handle the investigative work. And uh, we uh, did some numbers based on what uh, one of our sister cities had done. And <coughs> it ranged from you know, five to six new employees to do the work inside, I believe it was San Francisco. Um, but we are estimating a bit more conservatively, and I think the number that I uh, told uh, the team that was looking into this about a month ago was about three people to begin. And then we just have to, you know, do it for a while, see how it went, come back, you know, and just if there was more or less, bring it back to the council and talk about it. So if I understand that correctly, Mr. Chair, that's two people to be active complaint investigators, and this would all be complaint driven. And then there would be an additional five or six people back of house or an additional three people. I, I don't think I don't know that we would need five or six initially. Uh, but that's what San Francisco did. Now, San Francisco also underestimated the numbers of complaints that they would get. And so they've had to go back and increase the numbers. So I, I told the team about three people initially. So two people front of house, three people yes. back of house. Three okay. people total. Three people total. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. I just, I appreciate the problem. I, I'm concerned about the just the complaint driven nature of the problem and I just want to make sure that when we look at operationalizing something like that that we are prepared to put the resources to something like mm -hmm. that thank you mm -hmm. thank you uh, councilmember Gordon 